Hey, everybody. Welcome to another week, another Friday, another series of masterclasses. My name is Terry White. It's my pleasure to be presenting to you live once again on a Friday from beautiful, sunny today, Atlanta. So I'm just uh, popping into the chat here. I see a bunch of people in the chat already, ready to go. Um, Sam Peterson, hello. Um, is it Yamakorn? Yamakorn? Hopefully I'm saying that right. Hopefully I didn't do that too badly. Um, but um, I'm bad at names. Kathy, Karen, Robert, just welcome everyone. And for those of you who are watching on other platforms, remember that you can um, you can watch on any platform you're on. But if you want me to see your question or your comment, head over to b.net slash adobe live so b.net slash adobe live is the one chat that i'll get a chance to look at now it doesn't mean i won't glance at the other one from time to time but most likely i'll miss uh your your question if um you don't answer it on this or don't ask it on this particular platform um i may catch it but i probably won't <laughs> all right so just being honest all right so with that said today we're going to be taking a look at um what's new in Photoshop. So we're going to be doing some Photoshop work today. We're going to be taking a look at what's new in the latest version released at Max, uh, which was um, recently in October. So Adobe Max we, we is where we usually do our biggest releases. And this release was no different here at Adobe Max um, for the um, October release 2021. So I'm calling it the fall release because it's not October anymore. All right, so with that said, let's go ahead and uh, dive in. I'm going to hide that. Oh, I didn't. That's one thing I forgot to do. Forgot to share my screen. Let me share my screen here real quick. There we go. Cool, cool, cool. All right, we got uh, Photoshop up and running. I'm going to take you through the new features. Uh, we should have time for some good questions here. And I see all you folks over on Facebook and YouTube and Inst or not Instagram, but LinkedIn um, welcome, 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 Nadia and, and, and uh, Emda Brown and uh, Michelle and everyone else over there as well. So welcome for all the folks over there. But if you want me to see the chat, that's the one I'm going to be looking at. All right. So with that said, let's go ahead and dive right in. I've got Photoshop up and running. And before I forget, um, I'm running this today because this is one thing I always forget to talk about is that Photoshop... Most of the new products, Photoshop, Illustrator, InDesign, Lightroom, Lightroom Classic, they're all native on uh, Apple Silicon. So I'm running this on actually my little lowly MacBook Air M1 uh, today just because I can. So I'm running this on the M1 computer, uh, which Photoshop takes advantage of. All right. So with that said, uh, let's go ahead and dive into some what's new in Photoshop. We're going to start with making selections which is a key part of Photoshop. Um, hello, LeVon, and you're welcome, Sandy and Tanya. Great to see you as we're here as well. And Stoney, I see you there as well. Let's go ahead and dive into uh, Photoshop and making selections. So one of the um, things that we try to do with each, especially each major new version of Photoshop, is we try to uh, make it so that making selections, do we just give you another option? Now, that doesn't mean that you... Um, you're going to use every single option every single time, but you're probably going to use the options, depending on what you're trying to do, you're probably going to use them more often than not, especially the newer ones, because the newer ones are faster and easier. So for example, last year we introduced the, um, we introduced the object selection tool. And this year, even though we didn't get a new tool, we added something to the object selection tool. So with the object selection tool now, you've got the ability to um, do selections in a different way. So let me show you what I mean by that. So I'm going to switch over to the object selection tool, which is right here. And when I click on the object selection tool, you notice I get a choice at the very top. I've always had this choice of rectangle or lasso. So I'm just going to use a rectangle and I want to I select this dessert. So I'm just going to uh, make a marquee selection around it, and boom, it selected it in the shape of the dessert, which is great. But we've added something to this tool. So I'm going to deselect Command-D, PC Control-D to deselect. And you'll notice that 
uh, you might have seen it briefly, when I hover over the objects, they they highlight. And keep in mind, I'm not on like I'm not on multiple layers. That's just a single background, but it's hovering over and selecting different parts of this or identifying, I should say, different parts of the scene with the new auto masking. So for example, I can just click now. I don't have to use, a, I don't have to drag and it knows to select that object that it auto masked. If I hold down my shift key, which is always the way you add to a selection, I can click and add that one. I can click and add that one. I can click and add that one. I can click and add as many as I want. I chose all the red ones. But you can uh, shift click the ones you want and they will be selected that much easier, that much faster. Now, I love the object selection tool. The auto masking is cool. And yeah, I can see just it's faster. <laughs> you know, it, if it identifies it, it's faster to just click than it is to try and drag a selection around it. Now, the, the, select, the object selection tool still works the way it always did. So if I wanted to subtract part of a selection, I could hold down my option or alt key and drag a um, so drag to deselect or add to the selection. So either way, um, I get the ability to either just click or drag around whatever it is I want to select to select or deselect. All right, so now that I got those selected, what would I do with them? Well, you could put them on their own layer. You could copy and paste them. You could um, change them. You could do a non-destructive change. You could, so I'm going to do a non-destructive change. I'm going to go into my um, adjustment layers. We're going to do a hue and saturation adjustment. That puts a layer right on top of them. And you'll notice that it used the selections as mass so that it only affects those areas that I had already selected. And so now I can just freely change the color of those quickly and easily without having to go in and... Um, paint them or do some other weird way of getting them because I've got this great auto masking capability. So there we go. We'll make them purple. I like purple. I, I do a lot of things in purple. Anyway, uh, so we got that, we got that done. Now I'm going to turn off that hue and saturation adjustment just for a second, turn it back to red. And I'm going to show you a hidden thing that's not so obvious, even with this tool is the uh, ability. If I go to the background now, and Sean's giving away the plot. If I go to the background and I right click on this background, um, you notice there's a new option called mask all objects. And the mask all objects is basically taking what we saw with the auto masking and just saying, do it to all of them. Like just, I know what's here. I'm gonna choose auto mask all objects You'll get a progress bar. And that was so fast, I couldn't even pull the progress bar over on the M1. So great. That's one improvement right off the bat I see on this file is that it did it in probably half the time it was doing it on my older computer. All right. But anyway, that now it created all these masks in the layers panel that you can always go back to and use. It didn't change anything. It just generated the mask for you. So if I want to make a selection, I can hold down my command key on Mac or PC control key and click. And as I click through these, you can see that they're all ready to go. Now, to be honest, it, it's great for me to be able to show you this, but I don't know when I'd ever use that. Like, when would I ever want to mask all the objects and just have the mask sitting there? <laughs> like, well, I don't know when I would do that. Like, I don't know um, when I would choose that option when it's just so easy to click on the ones I want anyway when I need them. So, but if you need to generate all the mask up front, you've now got a way to do it. And I guess the Photoshop team figured, why not? We've already identified all the objects in the scene. Why not give you those masks in one fatal swoop if that's what you need? And if that's what you need, you got it. So that is the auto masking capability of the object selection tool. I'm gonna to show you one more thing about it and then we're gonna move on to the next thing. So the one more thing about it is that like, let's say, let's say I go to my next scene. You'll notice this little sp or spinny thing. It was spinning for a second and so fast on the M1 that it stopped already. But that means, and here I'll click to refresh. That means that every time you select the object selection tool on a new photo, it has to process 
what it thinks are objects. So now as I hover over the backpack, hover over the hiker, um, it, it's identify those objects. Whether I'm going to make those selections or not. So that's the point. If I go back to this one, um, it's already identified. But if I hit the um, hit the spinny thing again, now it's gone. And I don't know what happened there. Now it's now it's not select. Oh, because I'm on the wrong layer. There we go. There we go. All right. So now it's identified all those, and and that's great. But what if I don't want it doing that processing? Or what if I'm on an older computer and that processing is slowing me down every time I click that tool and it's having to process every single image every single time. Well, you'll notice that there's there's a whole new section up here called Object Finder, and that's really what this is. And there's an uncheck button. So if you don't want to use this feature, you can, or you don't need to use it right here and now, you can uncheck it, and that will stop that processing from happening. Now that means that the Object Selection Tool just goes back to the way it used to work you know, prior to October, but you would not have any processing. And if you did need to turn this feature back on, you just click the box again to check it. And this checkbox remains sticky across sessions. So it, um, if you turn it off, it's off until you turn it back on. If you turn it on, it's on until you turn it off. So that is the object selection tool and everything about it. All right, now let's move on to the next one which is a blank canvas. And I'm gonna show you what I'm gonna do on this blank canvas. I'm gonna get out of the object selection tool and I'm going to switch over to another product called Adobe Illustrator. And with Adobe Illustrator, I want to um, point out a couple of things. This was drawn by the, the lovely Victoria Pavlov. Uh, and I had her create this file for me because I can't draw. <laughs> anyway, I'm not, okay, I shouldn't say I can't. I'm not good at drawing. So I had her create this file for me and I purposely, she does, she's going to do it anyway, but I purposely said, make sure you use all the layers you want. Like create as many layers as you want to for this scene you're going to draw. And so she drew it and some of the layers you can see she named and some she didn't get to name or forgot to name. And I, the only thing I did was I went in and I locked the bottom two layers. These bottom two layers are the background and the table. I think it's the table. I don't even know what this, this last one is. It may not be anything. But anyway, I locked the bottom two layers because I don't need them. I want everything except those two layers. And what I mean by that is I want to take my selection tool. I'm just going to drag a selection around all of those objects on all of those layers. So now they're all selected. And I'm going to copy. Because although as a photographer, you might not be working with Illustrator a lot, Designers work with Illustrator all the time. And the interoperability between Illustrator and Photoshop hasn't always been the best. It's been okay. But what would happen is if I wanted to copy this and then pop over to Photoshop, and by the way, uh, because I copied it, if you didn't have a new document ready, when you go new document, you, you'll get a new document proposal called Clipboard. And that new document proposal called Clipboard just matches the size of what you copy. So therefore, it will create a new document that's the size of whatever's on the clipboard so that when it creates that new document, all you have to do is paste and it'll be perfect size. Now, the only thing I did was I just made that size bigger. So instead of 2734, I made it 3000. Instead of 5061, I made it 5500. So that's my new document that I created. Now I'm going to do a paste. And when I do a paste, that brings up this. And everything, these last four options were what you had prior to October. You had smart object, bring it over as one smart object, even though you copied multiple objects and multiple layers. Bring it over as pixels, which I don't know why you'd want that because that why it's vector. Anyway, <laughs> bring it over as paths that I could see or bring it over as one shape layer. So in other words, everything you did individually, no matter which one of these four options you chose, would always bring it over as one thing. And so now there's a new option, the top option, which is copy and paste as layers. So when I click OK, that brings over uh, in my layers panel over here on the right, all the layers that we just saw in Illustrator. So this is awesome because not only do I get all those layers, I can turn the um, layers on and off, but more importantly, 
if I go into a layer, I can um, select it and let's see which one this is. That's the left side. That must be the right side. I can go into the right side, for example, go to my direct selection tool here in, um, in Photoshop, select it, and now I can edit it right here in Photoshop without having to go back to Illustrator. So if I want to make changes to the vector, if I want to do anything, if I want to change the color, if I want to do anything to the individual pieces, I can without having to go back to Illustrator or even know anything about Illustrator because I can just work in Photoshop. So um, that is part of that interoperability between Photoshop and Illustrator that I think people, especially designers, will love. I know you're photographers, but if, if you're watching this, you're probably photographers. But if you got any design work, that you need done too. Now you know it's that much easier to go back and forth between Illustrator and Photoshop. Okay. Um, I would be remiss if I didn't go back to Illustrator and do one more thing. Again, I know this is not an Illustrator crowd, but let's go back and do one more because it's so easy. That's why I want to come back and do it. It's so easy to do that mere mortals, even Photoshop users that don't do Illustrator can do this. I'm going to create, I just create a blank document and had it ready to go. So this empty document, and I'm going to call this, um, I'm going to just click, I'm going to type some text. I'm going to call it Adobe Live. Okay, so now hold down my command key, just like I would in Photoshop. So I'm not doing anything that I wouldn't do in Photoshop. Hold down my command key, uh, start dragging it, hold down my shift key so it retains the proportions, and just make it bigger. Now we got text, Adobe Live, and again, nothing special, nothing that I couldn't have done in Photoshop the exact same way. I go to my properties panel. I'm going to make it nice and thick. Let's make it a, again, you make it whatever font you want. I can make it thin, but I want to make it nice and thick. So Adobe Live in black. And I'm just going to, just for my sanity, I'm going to adjust the kerning a little bit. That's the option or alt left arrow. And, um, or the tracking, I should say. And now that I got that done, I want to um, change the color. So we're going to go to fill color and just pick a different color. I just don't want it to be black. Any other color. All right, so, um, hey, we've been doing a purple theme today, so let's do purple. All right, so that's it. Text, font, bigger, bold, color. Same exact things you would do in Photoshop. But now that we got it here, why, why did I do it here? Because there's one easy thing to do here now in Illustrator. It's going to make your lives easier if you like working in 3D. Adobe acquired a company called Substance, and we implemented a lot of their products as a separate subscription for people that do 3D all day, every day. And um, they had this huge library of materials. They have realistic 3D painting. It's, again, a 3D person's world. But some of that stuff, some of the goodies, are starting to be sprinkled into the other products that we already that we have in our subscription, so like Illustrator. So, for example, if I were to go into the effect menu in Illustrator, there's a new 3D and materials choice that comes from Substance. So I don't have to have Substance. I don't have to know what Substance is. I don't have to know anything about Substance. I don't have to have it on my machine. don't have to buy anything. The goodies, the best parts for me, the non-3D person, come over to Illustrator. So if I were to now go to Extrude and Bevel, that will bring up a panel, which it always pops over on my other display. There it is. And now I can I can work, I can play in 3D, even though I don't know anything about 3D. I can move this, I can pan this around, I can, for example, get that like maybe looking like that. I can extrude the depth a little bit more. I can so now I got just simple menu commands. That's the object I was working on. I can go to materials. And this is going to look disappointing. This is the, the hidden part of this. Uh, how do you get the materials into your library? So you can actually use Adobe Capture to do that. So Capture can capture materials. And you can add them to your libraries and then use them. Um, I don't know if you'll be able to use them here, but you certainly be able to use them in places where you can use materials. All right, but anyway, uh, uh, um, base materials, like, oh, that's kind of boring. But notice there's a scroll bar. <laughs> like, I missed this at first. There's a scroll bar on the right-hand side. And if you scroll down, <gasps> that gives you a lot of those substance cool materials that I was talking about. So you can make this look any way you want it to look. So, for example, I kind of like the copper look. 
And I don't like, um, what was it I didn't like about this material? I don't like maybe the roughness of it. So let's pull it back a little. Oh, let's go the other way. There we go. I like that better. And you can choose this one. You can choose any material you want. And keep in mind, it's not fully rendered yet. So you're just playing around. Uh, but this, these materials are going to give you an idea of what it's going to look like once you render it. So let's go back to the copper. And let's go back to the um, to the roughness that I liked. There we go. And there's a um, render with ray tracing button in the upper right hand corner. So if you want to have that just continuously tra ray trace, that's what it will do um, when you've got that turned on. And if you want to speed it up, just turn it off. And that way you're working in kind of a non rendered mode versus a rendered mode when you're working with this. All right, so let's go through and let's actually, I want to pick a different one here. Let's go in and now let's go to lighting. And again, simple choices. Do I want the light from the top left? Do I want the light to be diffused? Do I want standard lighting? Do I want the light to be brighter? Do I want the light to be um, not as bright? Do I want it to cast shadows, which is at the very bottom? If I scroll down, oh, yep, shadows. Do I want it to cast a shadow? Yes or no, turn the shadow on. And again, uh, there's a shadow. I can, of course, reposition that shadow and choose the distance from the object and um, where the shadow is going to be cast. So basically, if you want to play in 3D and how diffused the shadow is, all of those things. If you want to play in 3D, you can um, certainly do that a lot easier. And again, without having to buy anything extra, you can do that right now here in um, Illustrator. All right. Now, uh, the question all the people will start to ask, is this coming to Photoshop? Um, maybe. Just can't tell you about things we haven't announced yet. But there we are. All right. So back to Photoshop. That was it. Just a quick detour just to do something different for a change, something fun. And let's head back over to Photoshop. All right. So now moving on to the next one. So let's head over to um, this one. So next up, we're going to talk about neural filters. Neural filters uh, are not new. They were introduced them last year. And neural filters, when we introduced it last year, for those of you who are not familiar with the term, there are AI-based, not Adobe Illustrator, but artificial intelligence, <laughs> artificial intelligence-based filters in Photoshop. So these filters uh, will analyze your photo and use machine learning to apply whatever effect you chose. So for example, I have a, and by the way, so last year we introduced them. This year we introduced new ones and we improved some of the existing ones. So I'm going to show you a new one first. The first new one I'm going to show you is called Landscape Mixer. Now, also some of the filters, which I scrolled, some of the filters are in beta, meaning they're still being worked on. You can play with them. You can try them if they work great. If not, no big deal. And also with all of the filters, you can give feedback. You can say, this worked great. This didn't work so great. You can explain why, what you're expecting or why it was good. And if you choose, you can even include the photo so that the team gets an idea of what went wrong. They can see it themselves. So for example, let's go to neural filters and I'll show you the interface and you'll see all the different categories. Yeah, yes, I get it. Skip the tour. I, I know what I'm doing. All right, now, and, uh, sorry I did not do this already on this machine, but I'm going to go ahead and download this uh, landscape mixer, which is the first one. So I normally would have gone in and downloaded each one, but I hadn't done that on this particular machine yet. And we're going to use that one, and we're going to use that one. <laughs> so I'm just getting them out of the way now. All right. Um, okay, we don't need to turn that one on. Okay, great. So landscape mixer, let's go there. So Landscape Mixer is one that, uh, here, let me download that one. I'm going to use that one too. All right, Landscape Mixer is one that is one of my kind of favorites now. I'm not a landscape shooter, but I kind of dig what this does. So let me explain what's going on here. You have your landscape that you opened up and you opened up in Landscape Mixer. On the right-hand side, you've got presets. These are just stock photos. These are presets that the team, you know, licensed and used that you can play with and, and apply to your photo. But if you don't want to use these, you don't have to. You can click on custom and use your own photo. So you can mix your own photos together to create 
a scene. So for example, I've got this summery kind of foresty mountainy scene and I, maybe I want to see what this would look like in winter time. So there's a winter preset for this. Now, if there wasn't a preset that I liked here and I don't maybe I don't want to apply the photo onto this one, you'll notice at the very bottom I've got sunset and then all the seasons. I've got spring, summer, autumn, winter, and these can be used in conjunction with presets or custom photos. So you can either use these individually, you can use the presets individually, you can use your own photos individually, or you can combine them all together. It's up to you. That's why it's called a mixer. So for example, let's say I want to see what this would look like in the wintertime. So I just click the winter scene. And like magic, it's processing on the device. Sometimes it depends on the filter. It will either process on the device or in the cloud. But <laughs> just like that. And it just boggles my mind. It even adds like a snow effect to the trees and puts snow on the ground. And it just basically turns the scene from summer to winter, just like that. Now I'm going to reset it because I'm curious to see, let's reset it. I'm curious to see what if I didn't use that picture? What if I just drug the winter slider over? All right, let's just now just not apply a picture. And it's a different look. It applies the snow. The trees look a little not so snowy because we didn't use the snow scene. But that's just dragging a slider over to make my scene look less summery and more wintry. Uh, I'm assuming those are words. And so I can do the same kind of thing. I can say, let's bring over autumn. And by the way, this is processing super fast. <laughs> I'm just like blown away by how quick this is. Now you notice... Well, that's kind of like weird. It's doing that to the trees and the, and the ground, but it's also affecting the sky here. So in the upper left corner, there's a plus and a subtract. I'm not going to get into it right now. I'll get into it on the next photo. But if you want to subtract part of the photo that you didn't want to be affected, you can click subtract and sub just subtract that out with a like a brush or um, one of the uh, AI-based selection methods. Um, so uh, yeah, I definitely would not want the cloud to be affected by this, but anyway, just, just the slider. So that was winter or spring. I don't know what spring's going to, how much spring's going to make a difference on this. <laughs> again, <laughs> the clouds growing trees. Uh, so I would again, paint out the cloud so it doesn't do the cloud, but, uh, that's what spring would do. All right. Uh, so that's the landscape mixer. And even if, no matter what you do, so even if I, let's say I apply the winter to it and it's even putting snow in the cloud there too. I didn't notice that the first time. Whenever I notice that the output is to a new layer. So whenever I click, okay, I could always go in and mask that and then, um, grab a brush, black paint, and just mask that feature out. Now my cloud's going to return back to its original color which that's fine. But if you don't want that adverse effect to part of the image, you could either do it, have it subtract it from the effect in the filter, or you can subtract it from the effect after the fact, uh, once you get back to Photoshop and you use just a layer. So I would, I would probably make that see that part of the cloud bluer to match the sky, but I can get rid of the, um, get rid of the, the snow out of it. <laughs> to, I would probably just actually remove the color altogether, just make that more white, uh, since that's kind of what's going on with the rest of the scene. All right, but anyway, that's the that's the landscape mixer. And again, uh, that's before. Yeah, because see, it was kind of reflecting, the, or the green was kind of reflected up there. That's why it's still green or after. And so I would just tone that down, maybe even use... Maybe even use like a sponge tool, just something I normally don't do. Duplicate this layer. Taking way more time on this one filter than I intended. But yeah, I would just kind of get that green out of it. Kind of desaturate it a bit. All right, you get the idea. I'm not going to spend a lot of time working on that one image that I don't care about. Anyway, next up, <laughs> let's go on. Uh, that's the landscape mixer. I have another one. And this is an example of when you have something in the image that, like the cloud, that you don't want affected, but this time it's a person. So I'm going to go to filter. I'm going to go to landscape mixer, neural filter, neural filter, landscape mixer, and turn it on. 
And this time I'm going to just drag summer over. All right, that's not what I want. So get back. And this time I'll just use the green green photo, green preset. That's what I want, but I don't, <laughs> don't want my hiker to be grassy. So um, like I said, there's a plus and a minus up here to, to get into all the selection methods, but you don't even have to do that in this case because... Notice there's a checkbox in the bottom right that says preserve subject. Now, by the way, yeah, I could always submit this and say, am I satisfied with the results? And I can say no and include the photo so they can see what it did and say it shouldn't have affected the person so that they maybe they train it better next time. But in this case, I would just check the box that says preserve subject, meaning don't do it to the person. And the person now gets deselected from that got it so the now the thing that makes this look a little less natural because if we look at the before there's the before the shadows from this person's feet were more pronounced and now they're less pronounced with the effect so again once i click okay i'd go in and maybe darken that part of the a layer up a little bit more to create especially under this one shoe it doesn't look realistic at all because there's no shadow under it so I definitely paint some shadows back in, but there you go. All right, so now uh, that's the landscape mixer. Next up, this is one that's near and dear in favor to my heart. It's the um, it's the depth blur. So for example, let's let me pop out for a second. Um, for those of you who are photographers will know what I'm talking about, but for those of you who are not photographers. Um, we have something called depth of field that we always are doing in our photography based on the lenses we use. So uh, more expensive glass gives us more um, faster lenses with a more shallow depth of field effects. So just to demonstrate that, I'm going to hold up this remote into the front of the camera and you can see the remote is focused, but look at me, I'm out of focus now because the camera focused on the remote and gives that shallow depth of field for the background. As soon as I take that away, I get back in focus again. So if you didn't have that capability in your um, photography or your phone, even your iPhone has portrait mode, but if you don't have that capability, you end up with a photo where everything's kind of in focus. And so I've got a scene here where we've got our, our person looking off at the distance, maybe at the apartment building they want to move to one day. And um, we want to create that maybe so that we have less focus on the building and more focus on the subject. So filter, neural filters. And let's go on to, um, we're gonna go to depth blur. All right, so with depth blur, we've got, um, it's processing right now. It's just going to automatically look, analyze, figure out what the subject is, and then just give that depth of field to the background. Now, it may look like it's, uh, uh, never mind, I'll get into that in a minute. So you have blur strength. So if I want it to be more out of focus, I can just cr crank up the blur strength and it will um, make the object more in focus or actually the subject will stay in focus and the object or the background behind uh, her will get less focused. So it's just, that's, oh, there we go. That's the depth blur filter, and that's before. Hang on, I, I, I moved the slider again. We're waiting. This time we're not getting any feedback that we're waiting. But we're waiting. Let's give it a second. There we go. So uh, there's before and there's after. So again, it, it's a subtle effect, but it's the kind of effect that draws the, the, uh, the person's eye to your uh, subject and less on the things that are distractions. So depth blur, it, it uses the lens blur filter technology that was already in Photoshop. So again, everything's output to a new layer. Once I click OK, um, that will I'll put it to a new layer. So I have that layer to do, to work with. If something got affected that I didn't want to, I can always mask it out or mask it in <laughs> if I wanted to. All right, so there we go. Uh, now, I'll show you this on a different example. 
Uh, this is a, a sur this is actually a replica surface. I hate this background. I really, really do. It's I don't like it at all. So I, I don't want you to focus on this background. I want you to focus on the subject. So same thing here, filter, uh, neural filters, and landscape mix, or not landscape mixer, depth blur, processing on device, and wait for it, wait for it, done. All right, so that's to me still too busy. I don't like the background at all. Have I made that clear? So I'm gonna crank it up a little bit, and this time we are gonna wait without moving it again. And it should take, I got to give them feedback that's not giving us a progress on the second time you move the slider. So I don't know if, yeah, there we go. It just, it like gives it the progress at the very end. It's done, but that's it. So uh, what I was going to say is it's not just blurring the background because you can do that already. You could just select subject, inverse, blur the background. But you got to keep in mind that there are other things involved here. There's the distance between this pepper and this pepper. There's the table that um, has to get more out of focus as it goes back. Even from the pepper, from the front of the pepper to the back of the pepper, it has to do that depth of field to figure it out and do what's, do what's right. So it's not just selecting the background and blurring it. It is really or, or creating that, that depth of field effect in a filter. All right, um, cancel out of that. Let's move on to the next one. A photo that's near and dear to my heart, my parents, back in their heyday. Um, and my sister sent me this photo and it's uh, black and white, never in color, but I wanted to see what it would look like in color. Now, if you've ever colorized a photo by hand, which I have, it can take a while. It can take day. It can take hours by, by easily take hours. It can take days. It can take weeks. Depends on how complex the photo is and how much work you need to do to it. So uh, having done this kind of work before, I'm always interested to see things that can do it faster, easier, better, or even just give me a head start. Because in a lot of cases, these neural filters, like depth blur is still like as someone's complaining about the way it looks. Depth blur is still a beta. It's still a work in progress. That's why I was in the bottom portion of the filters. So even if it didn't do it perfectly, if it gave me that head start, got me 70% of the way there, 80%, 90% of the way there, and all I had to do was tweak it, it's better than having to do it from scratch. Same thing with colorization. If I had to start colorizing this photo, I start on her faces and make their skin, try and get the skin tone and then there's shadows to deal with and blending and so forth and so on. That's why it takes so long to make it look good. So if I were to go to my filters, come down to neural filters, you notice that colorize, which these are all beta. So landscape mixer is not done yet. Step blur is not done yet. Um, harmonization is not done yet, which we're going to see in a minute. But colorize did move up to the featured area, which means they're, they like it. They think you can start using it now. You can always, there's never going to be 100% on every single photo, but they think it's close enough. And when I click OK on this or click to, to do it, there's nothing else to do. It just does it. And that's <laughs> that fast. It did it that quickly. Now, I got some things wrong. But, you know, like, for example, his sleeve should not be whatever brown or whatever color that's picking that up from her dress, maybe. But it shouldn't be that color. It got that wrong. But all the stuff it got right saved me hours. So for example, before, if it got this wrong last year, you just had click OK, and then you have to manually mask and undo and so forth and so on. Um, so for example, let's go in. So someone's asking, did you enhance this image? No, did not enhance it. Um, do you mean enhance for details? No, I don't think I did that on this image. I think it's whatever this was, this was it, it is. So that's why it's also kind of grainy in the background. Anyway, um, but before you'd click OK and that'd be it, you'd have to go fix it on your own. Now you notice there's this little preview window in the right-hand corner, and there's a uh, thing that says click to edit focal points. I don't know why it's called that, but I'm going to click to edit the focal point on the sleeve, and I'm gonna, that brings up a color picker. 
And I'm going to go ahead. Yeah, even the lapel pin and like the tie and so forth and so on. But anyway, I'm going to say that, hey, no, no, no. His sleeve shouldn't be any color. It should just make, just make it white. And it processes it and takes that out. And again, I don't know what this is on the table, but whatever that is shouldn't be brown either. So I can just click and take that color out. I don't know what this is going on down here. That looks like part of the tablecloth. Yeah, take the color out of that or, or whatever color it should be. You can make it that color. So you can fix a lot of this right here on the spot before you even click OK to do more. Now, the other question people always ask that are new to this technology is like, how did it know his tie was blue? It doesn't. <laughs> it may not have been blue. Uh, it just basically picks a color. So it, like, like if I went and found that tie and if, if it still existed, it might be red, it might be burgundy, it might be any other color. It, 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 so it doesn't know what colors clothing are. Uh, so it just takes a guess. But anyway, this is uh, the colorization that will, get, did it get me 100% there? Nah, I'd still do some tweaking on this. But now all I got to do is tweak versus start from scratch and color every single thing from scratch. That's the point of this. All right. Uh, well, thanks, Steve. Command on the Mac. What is it for PC? Control. Yes. All right. And so now click OK. And again, that's uh, on its own layer. So before, after. And just, again, doing that kind of stuff would take a while. But again, it's not for people. It's enhanced this year for people, but it was always good for landscapes. So I got this multi, you know, thing going on landscape here. Let's see what it does on this filter, neural filters. And let's go into um, colorize. Just click OK or turn it on. And I got most of it right. I don't know why. It's putting brown in the sky. <laughs> like it just likes brown. It puts brown everywhere. Uh, I don't know why it's putting brown in the sky on his image, but no problem. Just click into the sky in that area and bring up the color picker and make it whatever blue you choose. Now, I, I have, always have a hard time getting the blue. So one of the things I asked the team to do, we'll see if they listen to me. I like the blue that's already there. How come I can't just use an eyedropper and click on that blue? Give me that blue. That's the blue I want. But no, 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 I got to mix it myself. All right, so I, I would love to see an eyedropper in this feature. So click OK, and it will use that blue, uh, which may or may not be the blue I want it, but that's close enough. It's not brown, and takes that out of it. OK, um, so that is, and again, I could see, like, it kind of missed a little bit in here, and, you know, maybe, maybe I need to do a little more but I don't have to start from scratch. I don't have to do every little pixel manually. So that's the whole point of this, is that it is um, by far much, much, much easier to get you most of the way there, if not all the way, but certainly most of the way there with these neural filters. Okay. And one more. This is a new one I have not shown yet. You're going to be one of the first to see it. I, didn't, I don't even think I should. Maybe I showed this in my max class. I don't remember. But anyway, I know I didn't show this example. <laughs> so we've got uh, an obvious composite scene. That's the original scene. This is the model photographed probably in a studio because I can see all the studio lighting on her. And it just, it's not convincing. Because when you do a composite like this, one of the things that makes composites convincing is not just the, the beautiful cutout you did. That's the, that's the given. That's the like we expect it to look like it wasn't cut out. We expect it to look like there's no edges that you can see that this looks like it was there. What makes it look real is when the color and lighting match. So this would, like I would question this. If someone showed me this photo, I'd be like, why is she so, so bright and white light on her in a fall scene that doesn't look right to me. Now, you could argue they took a studio, they took a strobe or a flash out in the forest and photograph, but I still think it wouldn't be this bright, this white. So anyway, let's go into that layer, filter, neural filters, and come down to um, harmonization. And again, this is a beta, it's brand new. 
color transfer is brand new, landscape mixer is brand new. But anyway, harmonization brand new on and nothing happens because you have to tell it and you have to have layers, by the way, you have to tell it which layer to harmonize the one layer you select it with. So in other words, I selected her layer. I have to tell it, harmonize it with the background because it doesn't know, it doesn't take that uh, for granted because you could have 10 layers in the file. It doesn't know which one you want to use. So select the layer you want to use. In this case, I only have the other one, the background layer. And by the way, it's always too much. It defaults to this number of 75, which is like she's looking pumpkin-y now. That's too much um, of this strength. So I'm going to pull the strength back to about here. And let's reprocess it. Let's tone it down a bit. And I would say that's probably about right. But also, this again, a little too bright. Let's pull down the brightness a little bit. A little bit more. A little bit more. I would start to say that's starting to look more natural than what we had before. Because remember now, because it, your eyes get used to what looks better quickly. So again, this is before. Totally not real, not realistic now that we look at it. This is the after. It starts getting us there. Now, is it 100%? Nah, I still think her clothes are a little too bright for the scene. You know, it's a white shirt, so it's hard to tone it down more. But I would take that into Photoshop and maybe tone that down a little bit more. I would also tone down the edges of this cutout a little bit more because you, you can see some rim lighting on her shoulders. So there would be some little tweaks I would want to do to make it look even more realistic after the fact. But you get the idea is that this got me most of the way there. A lot faster than it would be to do it all manually. Um, so that's, again, our before, our after. Outputs it as a new layer. Click OK. And now we have this new layer uh, for our colorization that we can go in and continue working from or, start, or merging and then fixing the stuff we need to fix. So it's up to you. All right, um, next up, let's go into another blank screen. This time our blank screen, it was the second, last time was in Photoshop as well. This time we're not going to Illustrator. This time we're staying in Photoshop because we're gonna talk about something that's brand that's a brand new tweak that people that use gradients will really appreciate. All right, if you use gradients, um, one of the things that's always been a challenge since gradients back in the original gradient days is that gradients, they need to look smooth when they transition from one color to another. If you see banding, if you see stripes, if you see lines, if you see anything that makes the transition from one shade or one color to another color look different, then it's gonna look bad. So gradients need to look good. So, oh, scroll. The way we can make gradients look better now is with improvements to gradients. So I've got a gradient selected. I just went into the blues area and just picked a gradient. And by the way, you've got all these nice presets now for gradients. Oh, hang on, didn't mean to do that. You've got all these nice presets um, for gradients. So I went into the blues. You've got cloud. You've got incandescent. You've got um, pastels. You've got na natural, neutrals, neutrals, naturals, neutrals, oranges, so forth and so on. So I just went into the blues and picked one. And now you'll notice that there is a method choice. You have three methods. Percep perceptual is the new one. And here, I just want to make sure I explain this right. I've got a note. Um, if I go find my note, there it is. All right, so I'm going to just, uh, just read a quick explanation. So perceptual, this setting will display gradients the most closely to how humans perceive light to blend together in the, in the physical world. So in other words, this is the best one. Uh, this new mode is the new default in Photoshop and, that's, and Photoshop on iPad. This is the default on both. And uh, classic mode, this is setting preserves the same way Photoshop has displayed gradients for years. So classic is the old way. And linear, this setting is used, uh, this setting is often used in other applications, including Illustrator, and will display gradients closer to natural light, to how natural light appears. Uh, color geeks know that this is, this that in certain spaces linear mode preserve or provides um, more varying results. So in other words, perceptual is what you want, <laughs> unless you're trying to match something else. So uh, I'm gonna just drag one out and it, it may be hard to see it even on the stream or on video on YouTube or whatever, but 
it's a very natural looking blend from color to color. So just remember, gradients look better now. That's all you have to remember. Okay, next up. Um, and here I'll just drag it a different way and just maybe drag it not as much. And it's just the transition from color to color looks so much natural and so much better now. All right, so anyway, um, hopefully you can, hopefully that does come across on the stream. Again, it's not gonna be as good as what I'm looking at in front of me, but it should look good. All right, uh, last uh, couple things real quick. We're running out of time, so we got like a few minutes left. So first and foremost, um, this particular um, scene, I, I just grabbed it from one of my, um, my classes last week for masking. So last week we did Lightroom, we did all the new masking stuff, and I mentioned that it was in Lightroom, Lightroom Classic, and Camera Raw. So you got the same masking capabilities there as well. Um, a lot of that stuff is already in Photoshop. So you already have select subject, you already have select sky. So I don't know how much you would need it in Photoshop, but if you ever work in camera raw or the camera raw filter, you've got all the masking capabilities there as well. So if I were to go to the filter menu, come down to uh, camera raw filter, I got that same mask button that we saw before, click masking. And I got all the same choices we saw before. So if I want to select the sky, I can select the sky. And it selects the sky and the subject, but you already have select sky in Photoshop. You don't need to do it here. Um, but if you want to get into quick sliders to do things easier here, then you can. So if you want to dehaze that sky a little bit, you want to come. And by the way, you could always make this a smart object or a smart filter layer so that it's not permanent. But you go in, you can just quickly work with sliders and tweak based on the AI based selections, just like you do in Photoshop already. All right, next up. Um, last few minutes. So a couple of things really quickly here. So the invite to edit feature allows me to go in, for example, and copy a public link just like it did before. And if I go to my browser here, let's create a new browser window and bring that browser window over and paste that link in. All right, just copied and pasted a link. And that will show me the Photoshop file. So why would you do this? I want to send this Photoshop file to people to comment on. I don't, they don't have to have Photoshop. They don't have to know what Creative Cloud is. They only need a web browser and they can go in and comment. So I can say, for example, um, looks good and submit. And then um, I can sign in with my Adobe ID, which I should be already signed in or I can use a guest. So we'll use a guest and we'll call it Adobe Live. So Adobe Live is my guest, continue. And so now my guest says, looks good. I could also go in and, and use a pinpoint and I can say, remove reflections. Remove reflections, cool, great. And I can even, uh, the person can that's commenting can even draw and illustrate what they want. Um, remove or flip her over, okay. All right, so they're submitting these comments and these comments travel with this cloud document. And what's best is that when I go back to Photoshop for the first time now, uh, normally I would have to keep going back and forth and checking the web to see if anyone made any comments. But now you have the comment panel right here in Photoshop. So the comment panel shows me Adobe Live said these things and anybody else who said anything, John Doe says some stuff too. And I even see their markups right here in um, and, and Photoshop. I don't have to go to the web anymore to do it. And you'll get a notification letting you know that new comments have been left. Um, all right, so now that that's been done, that's great. Let's talk about one more thing. We have the ability also to invite to edit via an email address. And when you do that, here, I should have had this ready to go. Let's go um, this way and let's also close this. Head back to Photoshop, I closed it. Oh crap, I'm not signed in. Hang on, let me sign in real quick. Yep, continue, continue. Waiting for approval. Oh, I might run out of time. I may not get to do this. But um, you have Photoshop running for the first time in a browser, uh, which is an extension of Photoshop. All right, so, oh. Wrong window. 
There we go. And so now if I go there and I go to alpha, blah, 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 the, they would click the link that they got in their email and it would take them to the file that you, you're working on. And the difference is when this file opens, it opens in Photoshop with Photoshop tools in a web browser. So they can actually go in, see all the layers and start working on this file. So um, this is going to be huge for people that uh, you need to send things to that need to actually do some work. So you get basically the same Photoshop editing capabilities that you would in Photoshop um, on iPad. All right, uh, I'm out of time. So thank you everyone for watching and thank you for being here. I'm going to sign off now before I get cut off. Bye everybody. Have a good one. Thanks for watching.